Hi, I'm Eric Jorgensen. I'm from the University of Utah. What I'd like to talk about today is the recycling of synaptic vesicles. So uh, before we get started, I'd like to tell you a bit about synaptic transmission. So the way it works is that there is a cell body that can be very far away from the uh, synaptic bouton, an axon that extends all the way to this uh, uh, synaptic bouton, and that can be about a meter long. So the synaptic bouton needs to act as an independent organelle. So the way this works is that our synaptic vesicles are filled with neurotransmitter molecules, uh, and then these molecules, these uh, uh, synaptic vesicles, are then docked at the membrane. And so the way synaptic transmission works is that when there's a calcium influx, the vesicles then are uh, released, the vesicle fuses with the plasma membrane, and releases the neurotransmitter onto um, the receptors shown here. So by doing that, you lose the synaptic vesicle membrane and you lose the synaptic vesicle proteins. And so because that synapse is so far away from the cell body, the cell body can't replenish synaptic vesicles. So what you need to do is recycle them. And the classic mechanism by which that's done is clathrin-mediated endocytosis. And so uh, I'll tell you a little bit about that today. Uh, and then in the second half, in the second video, I'd like to tell you about some recent work of ours uh, demonstrating that there is a second mechanism for endocytosis at synaptic boutons, and this is called ultrafast endocytosis. And in this case, what we see is that the synaptic vesicle membrane is reco recovered very rapidly, about 30 to uh, 3,800 milliseconds, um, generating a synaptic endosome, and then that synaptic endosome uh, is resolved by clathrin-mediated vesicle budding. And this is also a very fast process. It only takes about three seconds. And then finally, when that uh, budded vesicle is uncoated, we've regenerated a synaptic vesicle uh, after only five seconds. And so this makes a synapse uh, be able to run at much faster speeds um, than with clathrin-mediated endocytosis. So again, uh, we have two videos that I'll be filming. The first is uh, this demonstration of uh, how synapses work. This is the work of Bernard Katz, showing that vesicles uh, have this exocytic property. And then secondly, I'll tell you about the classic work of Heuser and Reese demonstrating that vesicles are recycled via a clathrin-mediated process. In the second video, I'll tell you about uh, this recent work uh, identifying this ultra-fast pathway. So first of all, this work all relied on the work of Bernard Katz, who was working in the 50s and the 60s, and this is work that won him the Nobel Prize. Uh, and what he was doing was recording from the frog sartorius muscle. So he had uh, a sharp electrode shown here, uh, penetrating the muscle cell, and he could then record changes in potential of that muscle cell. And so what he'd see is that as long as um, there were no changes, the potential was constant at about minus 60 millivolts. However, he found that if he um, manipulated a pipette with acetylcholine in it and spritzed on a little acetylcholine onto the muscle, then he would see a profound depolarization shown here. Uh, and what he didn't know at the time, but we know now, is that on the membrane of the muscle, uh, are acetylcholine receptors, so that the acetylcholine molecules, shown in yellow here, bind uh, receptors, and these receptors are ion channels. So they open and allow cations to uh, enter the cell and cause this depolarization that you see here. What he then found was that as he reduced the amount of neurotransmitter released onto the muscle, he saw a proportional decrease in the response. And he could continue that until the response was zero. In other words, there is no minimal response uh, for a synapse or for a um, response to neurotransmitter. So this is much different than what he saw if he left the motor neuron in place. So here is a motor axon shown here. Here's the motor neuron, and here's the motor axon, uh, and is now forming a synapse on the muscle cell. And so now he simply records. He's not spritzing on neurotransmitter. He's just seeing if there are spontaneous events. And what he saw are these uh, spontaneous depolarizations of the muscle. Moreover, when he looked at them, they were a fixed size. So from this, he said that neurotransmission somewhat like uh, quantum physics, is a quantal response. There is a minimal response that the muscle will respond to.
So Katz uh, was aware of electron uh, micrographs that had just recently been done of the neuromuscular junction. This one's by David Robertson. And as you can see here, there are synaptic vesicles that can be seen in this micrograph. And so the way Katz thought about this was that maybe these vesicles are filled with neurotransmitter. Their size determines that there's a fixed amount of neurotransmitter in them. And that occasionally these spontaneously fuse with the plasma membrane. And so that's shown here. Uh, and when that occurs, a few of these ligand-gated ion channels will be open, and you'll see a fixed response. So in this case, it's a, a depolarization. Here we're showing a miniature current. And so these uh, events are called minis. And so uh, the quantal hypothesis has now become the vesicle hypothesis. So the idea now is that uh, the reason there is a quantal response at synapses is because of these vesicle fusions having a fixed amount of neurotransmitter. And so these, I just want to step back for a moment and, and uh, tell you a little bit about how, to, how these images were created. Uh, they're created by an electron microscope. Uh, first, what you have to do is embed your sample in plastic. In this case, I have a worm, a nematode, C. elegans. Uh, it's fixed and then embedded in plastic. Those plastic sections are then cut, or the plastic block is then cut into sections. Those sections are then picked up. A ribbon of those is picked up on to this grid which is mounted in a mount that will go into the electron microscope, and then you get an image uh, of the cross-section of the worm as shown here. And so the way the electron microscope works is that you have an electron source. Uh, the electrons then pass through your sample, which is on a, fil a thin film. And then the electrons pass through onto a film, onto photographic film, uh, and then that generates this image that you see. So uh, let's return now to the quantal hypothesis. So Katz understood that what he needed to demonstrate is that these synaptic vesicles fuse with the plasma membrane. And at the time, that was not widely accepted. People imagined that these synaptic vesicles could contain neurotransmitter, but they imagined that the neurotransmitter is being released directly through the plasma membrane, not via these synaptic vesicles. So to prove the quantal hypothesis, to prove the vesicle hypothesis, Katz needed to demonstrate that these vesicles fuse with the membrane, and that had never been seen before. And so he took on a grad student. Uh, his name is John Heuser, and John's job was to try to capture these events. And he was never able to do so. Uh, and in fact, John never got his PhD uh, working with Katz, or ever, for that matter. But he was obsessed with this problem and wanted to pursue it. So he then moved um, to the lab of Tom Rees, and together they worked out, I think, one of the most exquisite experiments in the history of science to prove that these vesicles actually fused. So let me tell you a little bit about that. So some of those experiments were done uh, at the Marine Biological Laboratory in Woods Hole, and these experiments were done in the 1970s, uh, and we'll return to the scene of the crime later in the second video. So here's Tom and John in the 1970s when these experiments worked. Uh, beautiful young men, uh, dressed uh, appropriate for the time. <laughs> so times have changed. So uh, what I want to show here is this device that they built. So what they did was they took a piece of the frog satorius, uh, uh, pectoral muscle, um, which is very thin and could freeze quickly, and that's why they selected it. And they left the nerve attached. So the nerve is still attached here. Uh, and they wrapped that around a stimulating wire here. And this is all mounted on this cylinder, uh, which was then held in place by a rod on this device shown here. And so here is where the uh, um, sample is. Uh, and then if you uh, look up here, you can see this rod that is holding this in place. And this was held in place by a solenoid. So there's just a friction connection. Below here is a copper block cooled in liquid helium to 4 Kelvin. So this is the temperature of outer space, right? At this temperature, all molecules stop movement. So then what they could do is they could uh, release that solenoid, 
and then using standard physical equations of acceleration, calculate the time it would take for uh, the sample to hit this copper block. There's a shutter that is removed, and then there's a trip, so that five milliseconds before it hits the surface, so it's falling, 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 five milliseconds before it hits the surface, that uh, stimulator then activates that nerve, that nerve then um, causes neurotransmission to occur, and vesicles are fusing, and then boom, it hits a copper block, and all movement stops. So what did they see? It's beautiful images. So here you can see uh, a unstimulated uh, neuromuscular junction, uh, you can see that there are vesicles that are docked at the membrane. And when they stimulate it and then froze five milliseconds later, you see that there are these fusions that are occurred. Uh, if you look here, here's a, a vesicle that has just fused. Here's another one that's just fused. And then here is one that's beginning to flatten out. So it collapses into the plasma membrane. And so I love this experiment because it required uh, knowledge of physics, it required engineering to be able to build this device, and they combine this with a deep understanding of biology to say, how are we going to prove this biological point? We're going to have to invent a new instrument. So it was really a wonderful experiment. So by doing so, the quantal hypothesis was proved correct. So there's a few uh, other um, techniques that they applied to this problem. Uh, and one of these is freeze fracture electron microscopy. So in the images I just showed you, um, those are very thin sections um, that are mounted in a transmission electron microscope. So what they also discovered was if they took that frozen block, that they could strike it with a knife uh, and split the ice in half. And what happens is the ice will break along the weak points. So the weak point uh, is at that lipid bilayer, because there's no covalent bonds between that lipid bilayer, right? They're just uh, interacting with each other because they're greasy. So what happens when you hit that block of ice is those split open, and you get two faces of that ice block. And so on one face is the extracellular layer, shown here, and the other is this cytoplasmic layer, shown here. And so if you look at those images independently, if you look at the cytoplasmic layer that's shown here, uh, and then if you look at the extracellular layer, uh, uh, oh, that's the extracellular layer, excuse me, and this is the inside or the cytoplasmic layer. And you can see these little bumps there, and those are proteins that are embedded in the membrane. So they can uh, image this because they sputter it with platinum. And what that does is provide contrast that will be visible in an electron microscope. And it also provides a shadow, so things look like they're three-dimensional. And so then they're imaged in a transmission electron microscope, and that's uh, how you get these beautiful images. So now they're going to take this technique, and they're going to apply it to stimulated uh, synapses and see what do those events look like in the plasma membrane. And that's shown here. So here, at zero milliseconds in an unstimulated synapse, you see these little bumps. And these little bumps uh, are likely to be calcium channels. And remember, I told you that calcium was required for synaptic vesicle fusion. Five milliseconds after the stimulation, they see that there are these invaginations. And what these invaginations represent is that there's a synaptic vesicle on the other side of the screen, and it's just fused with the membrane, and it's created a, a neck. And so when you split that, it breaks across that thin part of the neck because you can't cut all the way into that... Uh, a concave membrane, and you get these little discs. And so that is just simply the ice itself at that neck. And so once again, they demonstrated that synaptic vesicles fuse with the plasma membrane. So uh, at this point, it looked like the fusion took five milliseconds. Uh, we now know from electrophysiological experiments that that fusion actually is much faster. After, after the calcium transient, after the increase of calcium, we know uh, that it only takes one-tenth of a millisecond for that vesicle to fuse with the plasma membrane. Okay, so that is the proof that vesicles contain neurotransmitter and that neurotransmission is mediated by these vesicle fusions. What I'd like to talk about in the second half of this video is uh, what happens after that. What happens to that membrane uh, after it's fused? So, Synapses have to be very robust. So they can fire the neuromuscular junction, uh, can fire 100 times a second. And so every time you do that, you're releasing vesicles. And there's a limited pool, maybe 300 synaptic vesicles at a synapse. So you can see 
that at these rates, you would deplete the synapse of synaptic vesicles. And again, it's far from the cell body, so the synapse needs to recycle the synaptic vesicles. And so uh, Heuser and Rees realize that, and so they look for evidence of that. And so the first experiments they did is they stimulated very intensely, uh, and then they would uh, fix the sample uh, in a fixative, uh, and then uh, embed them in plastic and look at the sections to see wh whether there was any evidence of recovery or recycling of these synaptic vesicles. And so that's shown here in this image. Uh, you can see that there are, are these invaginations that are occurring. Uh, here's one, uh, here's another one here. And if you look at those, uh, they have these coats on them, these electron-dense coats. And those have been seen before. Uh, and uh, this occurs in any cell that is endocytosing material, like receptors or membrane. Uh, and those are clathrin coats, and they'd been seen in electron micrographs before. So now there was a, sort of a unified view of how you recover proteins and membranes, even at synapses. And it's done via this clathrin-mediated mechanism. So uh, this was not, uh, didn't show any timing. Uh, this was simply a highly stimulated synapse that was fixed. And so the issue is how long after stimulation did these vesicles get recovered? And so once again, they turn to the freeze slammer. So now what they do is they have their sample, uh, and they stimulate, and they just hold it for one second three seconds, for 10 seconds, for 30 seconds, and then they let it go, and then they freeze it on this copper block. So what did they see? So these, again, are these freeze fracture experiments. Uh, and at zero milliseconds, once again, this is just our control. It's unstimulated. You can see the, these, the, these buds here, these buttons, are probably calcium channels. Five milliseconds, you see these fusions. Uh, and then nothing happens. So the synapse is basically quiet. Until 30 seconds, you begin to see these invaginations. And so some of these invaginations uh, look like uh, proteins or coalescing. Uh, in other uh, images, you can see that they look deeper, as if they're being pinched off. So this suggested that this was the endocytic event. And it's not so dramatic here, but if they uh, provided a higher stimulation, then they would see many of these invaginations occurring at 30 seconds. So now we understand, we have a, 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 dogma, a dogma of how synaptic transmission works. Vesicles fuse with the plasma membrane, release neurotransmitter. The proteins that make up that synaptic vesicle and the membrane that makes up that synaptic vesicle has to be recycled. And so that's via a clathrin-mediated mechanism. Um, clathrin forms this superstructure or geodesic dome over this piece of membrane and then removes it from the surface to regenerate a vesicle. This clathrin coat is then removed to regenerate a vesicle. So the two important conclusions from this uh, video is that endocytosis, synaptic vesicle recycling, occurs via clathrin-mediated mechanism and it's rather slow. It takes about 30 seconds for these vesicles to be regenerated. So that um, is the conclusions for this video. Uh, I've told you about how synaptic vesicles uh, exocytose, how they fuse with the plasma membrane, and how we understand that that is how a synapse works. Uh, and then in the second half of, that, of this talk, I, I told you about how clathrin-mediated endocytosis recovers that membrane recovers those proteins to regenerate synaptic vesicles that can fuse again. In the second video, I'd like to tell you about some work that there is a parallel system that works on a much faster time scale to recycle synaptic vesicles. Thanks once again for listening, uh, and I encourage you to watch the second video. <laughs>